I think we can start, and I'm sure that more people will um, triple in as we as we go. So, uh, hi everybody, and welcome to the to our first uh, seminar of this term of this year. Uh, and uh, we have today Gregory Tucker as our speaker. Uh, Gregory uh, started his uh, academic career in Brown University. Actually, I learned that you actually you were an anthropologist uh, back then. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, moved on to pursue his PhD at Penn State, uh, did his uh, postdoc at MIT, um, spent uh, some time as a lecturer at, at Oxford, and then um, moved to uh, Boulder, Colorado, um, and uh, as, as a faculty there. Um, and uh, Greg uh, is a geomorphologist. He, he was really focusing on, um, you know, landscape evolution and studying landscape evolution from both uh, field and modeling uh, perspective. Um, and when I say modeling, I'm, I'm really meaning that he's, he's not just, you know, an end user, but really builds uh, builds up modeling and modeling platforms, uh, really from the know fundamental fundamental physics of earth surface uh, processes um, and then he may, and his group are using this model to study you know uh, earth surface processes on various time scales from natural hazards to really long term you know formation of basins and, and landscapes and ultimately you know translates you know the, the topography into uh, insights and understanding on uh, the underlying processes of uh, landscape evolution. So I'm really excited to uh, have you here as a, a speaker and uh, please take it away. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thanks for the invitation to join you all for this talk. Um, I thought I would share a project in tectonic geomorphology um, that was inspired uh, several years ago when my, my co-authors and I had the a lucky opportunity to be doing field work in central Italy in the Apennines, left the region of active tectonic extension and, and it got us curious about some of the really classic landforms that you find in areas with active tectonic extension. Um, and it turns out um, you can find the same kind of things in my own, not exactly my own backyard, but a, a little bit closer to home for me than Italy. Um, this is a view of uh, what's called the Wasatch Front in the state of Utah in the Western United States. Um, and you can see here um, the range. This is called the Wasatch Range. Uh, that's a rising foot wall block. And in the foreground, the basin, which is subsiding. And right along the fault trace, um, well, you can see the shoreline from ancient Lake Bonneville. But here, what we're interested in is these really steep slopes like this one that are facing out toward the basin and have roughly a triangular outline, at least in this case, and sit between these transverse canyons. Um, these are sometimes called facets, like facets on a gemstone. Um, here's another view of the same region. Again, you'd see the mountains up here and the basin down here with some settlement for scale. And again, right along the edge of the active range, you get these steep basin facing slopes and they truncate mountain ridges. Um, and, and I'm just gonna to refer to them as facets. So just for a reminder to those who maybe don't think about um, active tectonics on a regular basis, that the kind of geological situation we have here is one where the, the crust is being stretched. When that happens, because the upper crust is brittle, it tends to break into blocks, like in this textbook diagram. So you have foot wall blocks that rise to become mountain ranges and um, hanging wall blocks that sink to become basins and fill with sediment. And we're really interested in what happens right at the seam between these, these two things. So it turns out you can find these classic facet landforms in mountain ranges all around the world, wherever you have active tectonic extension. So here are a couple of examples. Here's one from uh, the state I live in, in Colorado in the US, along the Sangre de Cristo range. There's one in the Lake Baikal rift zone in Russia. So again, these really, here's the fault trace running along here and these really gorgeous, steep basin facing slopes. Here's an example from Tibet. You can see roughly the fault trace runs about here and above it, you have these rocky steep slopes. There's a lot of them in the Mediterranean um, where you have the Mediterranean extensional areas in Italy and Greece and Turkey. 
Here's an area in Turkey. Um, and again, you've got a foot wall block here, a hanging wall block here, and steep slopes right at the edge, rising up from the fault trace, which more or less is where this road goes. Um, so as I said, I first got interested in these things when we were working in Italy. Here's a couple of examples from uh, central Italy where you can really see the contrast between the rising foot wall here with very little vegetation and the subsiding hanging wall, which is more vegetated and sediment uh, laden. So as far as I can tell, geologists have been curious about these steep so-called facet slopes as long as there have been geologists. One of the first people to actually write down his thoughts in a systematic way was the American geologist, uh, G.K. Gilbert. So Gilbert spent much of his life and career exploring the Western US geology. He was starting off having worked in the East where there's ancient thrust tectonics. So he was sort of expecting lower angle faults and ancient things. And he found something very different in the West. He wrote the following about these facet landforms. He supposed that the dip of the fault corresponds so nearly with the angle of rest. By angle of rest, he means an angle of repose, like maybe 35 degrees for a pile of sediment. That adjustment to stability involves little or no wasting. In other words, he's interpreting these things as being basically tectonically generated landforms with very little erosion. So Gilbert's contemporary was the geologist uh, and geomorphologist William Morris Davis, uh, the guy who gave us the geographical cycle concept Davis had a similar idea. He wrote in a 1903 piece that the slope of the spur facets may not be greatly unlike the slope of the faults. Now, neither of these gentlemen knew actually what the slope or the dip of the faults below were at the time they were writing. So this was supposition. Here's how Davis illustrated it. He imagined that you'd have a, a rising footwall block like this one, a subsiding hanging wall block. Here's the fault. And notice that he draws the fault traces going right up and basically becomes the surface of the facets. So these facets are, in his view, just exhumed fault planes. And as uplift and erosion proceed, they take on a triangular shape once, uh, once these canyons start to, to form steep side slopes. But it turns out there's a problem with this that was discovered as soon as people began to excavate quarries uh, across active normal faults and to uh, think about what those quarries revealed. As it turns out um, that typically, and we now know that extensional faults typically dip a lot more steeply than either of these guys supposed. Here's an example of one of my co-authors, a tall geomorphologist named Dan Hobley, standing next to an exhumed piece of the Wasatch Fault in a quarry. Down below is a view of that same quarry having exposed the fault here, the facet surface above. So the facet is steep, it's 34 degrees, but the fault itself is, is much steeper. Um, so that led an, another somewhat later American geologist named James Galuli to come up with a different interpretation. Here's what Galuli wrote. A wedge having an apical angle of 30 to 40 degrees has evidently been removed from each facet. In other words, in his view, these are erosional features. They're not just fault planes but they're things that have been substantially modified by erosion as fault slip has proceeded. So later observations have borne out Galuli's view. It's clear today that these are erosional features. Um, in the upper right is an example of a cross-sectional profile across one active fault in Italy. It's called the Campo Felice Fault. Um, there is a fault scarp that reveals that the fault plane is dipping at 60 degrees. The facet surface above it here in red dips about 39 degrees. That's steep enough to be scary. I know because I, I climbed up it to survey it, um, but it's not nearly as steep as the fault itself. So clearly facets are erosional features. And that raises the question of whether there's maybe useful information about the dance between geomorphology and tectonics encoded in these features. And that, that's, that's sort of what's motivating our work on this problem. So one of the things, if you go out and look at different, uh, different normal fault systems, different faults in the same system, one of the things you find is that there's tends to be a, a wide variety of different angles to these features. So here are a few examples 
um, from both Italy and the Western US. In the lower right is the Campo Felice fault, the one I just showed. Um, and it's one of the steeper examples I've seen with dips of this steep mountain surface being you know, on the order of 40 degrees in some places. Um, you can find other examples in the upper middle is one from Italy. It's platform carbonate. So you can see really clearly the, the difference between the foot wall here and the hanging wall here. Um, and here, these facet slopes are in the upper 20s of degrees. And on the left are a couple of examples that are below 20 degrees, in this case, only about seven. So one of the things that's clear is that there's a range of different slopes. And that's an interesting question. Why? What is it that determines what that slope angle will be? Another interesting uh, feature of these things is that they're often pretty planar in cross section. That is, if you go between the gullies and canyons. Um, here's an example of a series of profiles uh, on various facets in the Wasatch system. So we have on the x-axis distance above the base of the mountain front in meters, so zero to 70 meters. On the y-axis is height. There's no vertical exaggeration. Um, and you have profiles with dips ranging anywhere from 14 to 38 degrees in this data set. And one of the things that really jumps out here is, is just how planar they are, planar to slightly convex upward. Um, and that would make sense if they were just exhumed fault planes, but we know they're erosional features. So why is it that the geomorphic system has conspired to give us these really planar landforms? It also turns out that you can find variations in the degree of soil cover on these features. So some of the examples, in fact, a lot of the examples we've seen in the Western US are pretty covered by soil. It's a fairly continuous soil mantle, not always all that thick, but you know, maybe half a meter or so um, varying from place to place. You can get a little bit of sense of that in these photos, occasional bedrock outcrops. On the other hand, some of the examples in the uh, Apennines we've seen are pretty bare and rocky with only a discontinuous kind of a scree on it. So why is that the case? How come, how come there's differences in the degree of soil mantle? Another difference that you find has to do with what happens at the fault trace. Some of uh, these fault systems have a clear slope break right at the fault trace. Here's one example from the state of Idaho. Here's another example from Italy. Another one below that where you can see a nice cross section where a canyon is cut through. The rising footwall bedrock here is a bit steeper than the um, scree deposits that are in the hanging wall. On the other hand, there's other examples you can find where you don't have such a clear slope break. And you can find these um, also in Italy. So in this upper left image, there's a bedrock fault scarp, and we'll talk about more in a second. But above it, the slope is similar to the slope below it, even though we're going from thinly mantled bedrock here to um, slope deposits and unconsolidated material down here. There's another example in the bottom picture from uh, Southern Italy. So why do you sometimes get a slope break and why sometimes not? Another curiosity that we got interested in is the existence of these fault scarps. These seem to be common in the Apennines and elsewhere in the Mediterranean, um, like they've been reported in Greece. They are um, clearly fault scarps because you can see slick insides. Um, they are uh, they're, they're clearly exhumed fault planes. Here's one of my co-authors, Scott McCoy, for scale. They are taller than the offset you would expect in one earthquake, but they're much shorter than the total offset in the lifetime of these faults. And it turns out that careful um, cosmogenic exposure age dating uh, has, by, by a couple of different groups, has shown that these are largely latest Pleistocene to Holocene features. In other words, if you date the exposure on these, on these surfaces, they represent slip over maybe 10 or 15,000 years or less. So why, why are they there? All of those questions have motivated us to think about whether we could formulate a, a process-based model that could account for these kinds of characteristic landforms and allow us to probe whether their morphology might contain useful clues about what's going on below our feet. So one place to start there is just to think about the geometry of uh, an idealized normal fault system uh, and how it might create these sort of planar features. 
So in this illustration is a schematic um, cutaway of a hypothetical normal fault system with the foot wall here that's moving up and to the right and the hanging wall here that's moving down and to the left. And we have some fault with a dip alpha. And a thought experiment you can do is to imagine that you have a time machine. You go back and you put a marker into the bedrock right at the fault trace. And then you come back a thousand, a hundred thousand years later, let's say, and look at what has happened to your marker. So if we were in a world with no erosion, what you'd expect to happen would be your marker starts out here and it just gets translated up along the fault plane until it arrives at some point, say here. Um, that would have been uh, Gilbert and Davis's view, you know, 150 years ago. Um, yeah, maybe the fault blocks would rotate, but here we're talking about a time scale that, that where that's probably not a big deal. But of course, in a world, in the real world, we have erosion. And in a world with erosion, if the erosion rate is En, then over that same time period, you would have gotten some depth of erosion accumulated at that corresponding point of the facet. And if you um, came back periodically over time to look at what happened to your marker, let's say your marker is moving up, and let you have a way to keep it glued even though there's erosion happening somehow, um, you would find that the higher up the facet you go, the more time you've had for cumulative erosion. So that the distance between the projected fault plane and the slope surface is really all about increasing erosion over time. In other words, this is kind of like a tape recorder. The higher up you go, the longer that point has been exposed to an erosive environment. And that should give you, ideally, if the fault slip rate is steady and the erosion rate is steady, should give you a planar slope. The other neat thing about this is that the dip of this surface should depend on three things. It should depend on the fault dip, which is what it starts out as, that's alpha. And that usually we can work out. And it should also depend on two other things that often we don't know. It should depend on the erosion rate and the fault slip rate, V, and their ratio. And the neat thing about that is, in principle, if you knew one of those two things, you could extract the other. The other interesting thing is that it implies that all else equal, a faster slipping fault should produce steeper facets. So that's a testable prediction. So how would you apply this? Well, if we want to, one way we can apply it is go to a place where we think we know the fault slip rate and see if we can back out an erosion rate, again, just from this geometry. So we tried this at a, at a location on the Apennines where um, a French group has done some of this cosmogenic exposure age dating to get fault slip rates. And here's a photo from some of their work. It's a paper by Schlagenhoff et al. Um, and they have sampled for cosmogenic nuclides, chlorine 36 in this case, up and down this fault plane to try and get a sense of, you know, how, how long has it been since this piece of rock has been exposed to the elements right near the surface and this piece of rock. And what they show is that this surface, this fault, um, fault scarp has been progressively exposed over a period in this case of roughly 7,000 years. Um, which translates to an average fault slip rate of somewhere in the neighborhood of a millimeter and a half to one, a little less than two millimeters a year slip rate. So if you use that together with the geometry of this facet and the dip of this fault, it implies an erosion rate somewhere on the range of 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters per year that's averaged over a period of about 200,000 years. And that's a neat piece of information to be able to extract because it's a time scale that's often not accessible to measures of erosion. We don't have an independent uh, measure of erosion right here, but, um, uh, but we can at least say that this is a reasonable and expected rate for this environment. The other thing we can do is to try to test the predictions of the simple geometric model is to go to a place where we know if not the absolute slip rates, at least the spatial pattern that they trace out. And it turns out that a normal fault array is a good place to do this because fault theory tells us that we should expect a systematic spatial pattern of slip rates. And it's illustrated in this figure to the left. This is from a paper by the late Patience Cowie. She's the person who introduced me 
to the Apennines. Um, and I have much to be thankful to her for. But in this upper left figure, Patience is showing a hypothetical sketch of what a, the early stage of a normal fault array might look like. Each of these little arc things is meant to be one fault, and the arc shape shows the slip profile on the fault. It's pointing out that you expect the greatest slip rate to be in the middle of a segment, tapering off toward the ends. And the lower uh, picture shows what happens after some of these faults have begun to link up underground. And it's illustrating that all else equal, you expect the greatest slip rate to be in the middle of the array as well, if you have an array of connected faults tapering off toward the ends with some complexity having to do with the geometry of the interlinked faults. So the message is if we have uh, an array of faults or even a single fault, and we could look at the angle of facets along it, we should expect them to mirror the slip rates. So a place to test this is the same place I've shown you some photos of, the Wasatch Fault System in the Western US. So this is a fault system that stretches over about 350 kilometers. Um, it's shown in this um, map here in the middle, um, stretching from southern the state of Southern Idaho all the way through central Utah. Salt Lake City is here, there's the Great Salt Lake. Each of these lines traces out one of the segments of the fault and the darker colors represent faster slip rates. Um, so already we have a hint that there's slip rates that are faster in the middle of this array. So what if you were to go and measure facets all along this array and look at how their slopes are varying from north to south? Well, that's something that my um, co-author Will Struble did as part of an undergraduate project working with our other co-author, Scott McCoy in Nevada. Will's now a postdoc in Arizona. So Will took LIDAR data and basically measured facet gradients all along this array from north to south. And the question is, if you take all those measurements and you plot them against distance, what will you see? Will you see a systematic pattern such that the facets are steeper where you have uh, the middle of the array and you expect steeper slip rates? Or instead, the pessimist view, will there be so much noise related to things like, you know, different lithologies and different fault geometries that you just don't see a coherent pattern at all? So that's the question Will uh, answered. And here's his, here's his answer. This is a plot showing distance on the x-axis from north to south um, over about 370 kilometers. On the y-axis is fault dip angle, inclination in degrees. Each point is one of Will's measurements. The vertical dotted lines separate the individual fault segments in the array. The blue lines are slope averages for each segment and the red lines are moving averages. So if you stand back and look at this, I think you could, uh, it's hard to ignore that there's a systematic pattern here, right? That the facet slope angles are lower on the north end, kind of 20 degrees, and the south end, downward around 10 degrees than they are in the middle where they cluster somewhere around 35 degrees with occasional points in the 40s. So there is a systematic pattern with a fair amount of scatter around it, as you might expect. The other question is whether you see the same pattern in an individual segment, which is also what you should expect to see. And there, there's hints that you do on some segments. Probably the best example is this one, which is called the Levon segment stretching from here to here, um, there's, you know, the moving average here indicates that there's much steeper facets around 30 plus degrees in the middle, as opposed to the tips where it's more like 10 or 15. So it looks like a general confirmation of the basic idea that yes, facet slope should mirror slip rate. The obvious question is, well, do we know what the slip rates actually are on these things? And the answer is sort of. <laughs> Here's what um, paleoseismologists tell us about the slip rates. This again is the same x-axis, so zero to 370 kilometers here along the fault array, vertical slip rate here. And the black line shows estimates from paleoseismic trenching of Holocene average slip rates. And indeed, it shows that the central segments seem to be slipping much faster than the ones to the north and south. On the other hand, there's some evidence that this is a sort of an unusual fault array in that it, uh, it used to have an enormous lake in its basin, Lake Bonneville, that has since evaporated. 
and that may have led to a transient acceleration in slip. So there's some geological evidence that the longer term slip rate, kind of 100,000 year average is uh, more like this hatchard box here, um, still faster in the middle, but not as fast. Um, so there's some ambiguity about what quantitatively are the slip rates. The blue line shows a, a quick estimate that we did trying to infer the slip rate directly from the average facet gradient, um, just to show that you might do this. But here's the catch. That required us to make an assumption about what is the relationship between the slope angle and the rate at which the facet is eroding. It turns out that's a tricky question to answer and that motivated uh, sort of what I'll show you in the rest of the talk, which is an attempt to build a process-based model for the evolution of a facet profile. So the first thing you have to do if you want to think about building a model uh, for facet profile evolution is what are the processes? And there's some, some debate in the literature about what that is. Some focus on weathering and soil formation. Others emphasize landsliding. One question is, okay, well, is, is landsliding a big deal for these kinds of landforms. Uh, and our, our, so this is a tricky question to answer, but one way you can try to answer is just by inspecting the, uh, the topography. And you do find along the Wasatch system, some, um, some uh, cases like this one here, which is almost certainly the remains of an old deep seated bedrock landslide. There's an indentation in the mountain front here. There's a hummocky pile of debris that's since been smoothed off, um, almost certainly the remains of a large deep-seated landslide. Yet what we see is that this seems to be the exception, not the norm, that in most of the time, these steep facet slopes um, do not have these kinds of signatures of deep landsliding. So that's led us to tentatively conclude that the processes we need to focus on really are about the weathering of bedrock to form mobile material, the creeping of that material, and when slopes get really steep, the so-called ravel-like motions or basically pebbles rolling downhill under gravity. So that'll be the basis for our model. Now, it turns out um, geomorphic theory is really good at, at relatively gentle soil mantled slopes. We have pretty good models for that. Um, but for these steep slopes that are born as bedrock scarps and gradually weather and round off to form still pretty steep facets, that may or may not have a blanket of soil, we don't have a current widely accepted theory for that. So we're gonna to have to make our own model. For a variety of reasons, we chose actually to formulate a model based not on continuum theory, but initially at least using a cellular automaton approach. And the advantage of that approach is that we can think about granular mechanics as part of the problem. What happens when you have collections of particles that are moving, colliding, being pulled by gravity and so on. So we set out to create um, a, a model, both a, a theoretical framework and a code. And I wanna just briefly nod to um, a piece of technology that uh, made it possible to do this. Um, so I work with the Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System, which is, uh, or CSDMS. It's a, a facility supported by the US National Science Foundation to help the Earth surface dynamics community do its modeling work in an efficient way by sharing uh, modular codes, uh, by providing libraries, so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel when they want to do models. Well, one of the products uh, that we've developed as part of that effort is called LandLab. It's basically a Python language programming library that uh, is meant to accelerate the process of building and refining and improving process models. And so, and here are a few examples of ways in which LandLab has been, been used in various applications. So our interest was in using LandLab to build this cellular automaton model using a kind of a cellular toolkit that's part of LandLab. And I'll show you what our model formulation looks like. So this is our view of an idealized cross-section of a facet. It, it doesn't, it looks a little abstract here, but the idea is we're looking at a vertical slice in which there's a, a mesh of cells. These are hexagonal cells. And each cell takes on one of a few states. It could be air in blue. It could be bedrock in gray. It could be um, colluvium or sedimentary material 
in, um, in the gold color. And the sedimentary material can either be resting or it can be in motion in one of the six lattice directions. Then the dynamics are described um, using a stochastic transition framework. So the way this works, for example, is if I have a downward moving grain above an air cell, there is a specified probability per unit time that those two will trade places, meaning that the grain has fallen by one cell. And this turns out to be a pretty good way to represent granular mechanics without solving the full discrete element model problem. So it's sort of a poor man's uh, discrete element model. And in our case, we've taken this uh, so-called lattice grain framework and added two geomorphic rules to it. And I'll illustrate what those look like. So if you have a, a cluster of cells, we have some bedrock and gray and some air here. For every pair that juxtaposes rock against air, say this one or this one, there is a certain probability per time that weathering will cause the rock to uh, convert to colluvium. And for every piece of colluvium that's in contact with air, there's a certain probability per time that it will be disturbed. And disturbance is meant to represent processes like the burrowing of animals or the growth of plant roots that will displace soil. So in this case, for example, we might have a disturbance transition that will shift this soil particle and put it into motion. Once it's in motion, it's governed by a set of rules for gravity, collision, and movement so that our moving cell rotates downward, falls, and collides. So that's the essence of this geomorphic model. There's two dimensionless parameters in the model. One is a dimensionless weathering parameter that represents, so I'll call that W prime, and it represents the maximum rate of bedrock weathering scaled by the fault slip rate. Um, and we can tie this to field measurements of rock weathering. Then there's a dimensionless disturbance parameter, D prime, that again, it's the disturbance rate scaled by the fault slip rate. And again, we can tie this to field measurements of so-called geomorphic diffusivity. So those are the only three parameters in this model. Again, we combine that with these so-called lattice grain rules um, to get an integrated simulation. The lattice grain rules do a reasonable job of accounting for kind of first order granular mechanics. So they'll give us sand piles, for example. And one of the key things is it imposes a, an angle of repose. And in this case, the angle of repose is 30 degrees set by the lattice geometry. And that becomes really important to this problem. So we wanted to see if we could test this model. And we did this in a couple of ways. We went to um, a couple of sites where the rate of erosion is known and we know something about the rate of uh, disturbance, the disturbance parameter. One of the sites is what's called the Gabalon Mesa. Um, this is an area of uh, soil mantled hills in central California. Here we're gonna take a, a cross-sectional profile and see if without calibrating the model, simply using known information from that site, we can reproduce that profile. Here's the model generating a convex upward hill, and here's that hill compared with the field data, which is shown in black. So this is distance versus height, um, and the model does a pretty good job. We tested it also in a place where we, can, where we have rock and weathering and steep slopes. So this is a site called Ukaipa Ridge. We'll take a profile across this active ridge in Southern California. Um, here we did have to calibrate a weathering parameter because we didn't have independent evidence for that. But if we do that calibration, turns out the model can um, match the morphology. It'll give you these planar slopes with a discontinuous mantle of sediment, which you can sort of just about see with these gold colors on top of rock. The other set of tests we did was to make sure that we can reproduce what that geometric model predicts that I showed you earlier. Um, and I won't, I won't go into great detail on this other than to point out that if we impose an erosion rate on this model, which we do by, by having it be a, a, a dissolution problem, in other words, rock disappears instead of making colluvium, we can match the expected analytical solutions. This is a plot of our erosion rate, which in the model is a dissolution rate here, against the expected sign of the difference between fault dip, 
and facet slope. The straight line is what geometry predicts, and the um, dots are the model. So we, we have some confidence in this model. And that then allows us to um, do some experiments and to see whether the model can account for some of the slope forms that we see in nature. So one of the things you could do is do a systematic set of parameters, a systematic set of experiments with these two parameters on weathering and disturbance. So I'll, I'll show you now four experiments that explore that space. And the first one will be a case where we have really inefficient geomorphic processes or equivalently really fast fault slip. And here's how that case comes out. So we're looking at a cross section of a moving um, fault foot wall. So the hanging wall is the datum. You can see the bedrock in gray forming a steep facet slope with a little bit of colluvium on it, these little gold dots here, and then a colluvial wedge below that is right at the angle of repose. So then you can ask, well, what happens if I have a really efficient geomorphic system or equivalently a really low rate of fault slip? We'll put that experiment up here. And the result doesn't look too exciting. It's a pretty low relief system. The, basically, the geomorphic system is eating away at this rising block as fast as it can rise. You end up with a soil mantled low hill-like feature here. From there, we can start to pick apart and ask, well, for example, what if I had rocks that were really resistant to weathering, but the transport system was really efficient? So imagine maybe I'm in a wet climate and I have quartzite. Maybe that quartzite is weathering to individual sand particles that are really easy to transport. What would that look like? Well, here's what that experiment looks like. Because the rock is resistant, again, relative to the fault slip rate, I get a pretty steep facet. But because the material is easy to transport, I get a rocky surface and not much of a colluvial wedge below. So then you can try and guess, well, what happens if I do the opposite? If I have rock that's fairly easy to weather, but the transport system is relatively inefficient, maybe because it's anchored by vegetation or maybe because I'm in a really arid climate. We'll fill in the box here with that scenario. So here now I have um, a facet slope that's right around the angle of repose and that grades smoothly over into a colluvial wedge down here. Interesting, so now there's no fault, there's no slope break at the fault trace as there was, for example, down here. So it, you get a sense that this model does account for some of the variation in morphology we see, or at least it, it can reproduce it. Um, one question we can ask is, you know, it seems like a lot of facets in nature seem to cluster around the nominal angle of repose for colluvial material. Not always, but often. Why is that? Um, well, one possible explanation um, is that that's a kind of an attractor state. Um, and that's hinted at in this figure, which shows the results of a variety of model experiments, like the ones I just showed you. Here we have the dimensionless weathering rate parameter against the facet angle that's simulated by the model. Each dot is one model experiment. Um, the different symbols represent different efficiencies of weathering. And one of the things we find is that, or efficiencies of disturbance rather, one of the things we find is that if you have relatively, if you have a weatherability that is a maximum weathering rate faster than the fault slip rate, so everything from 10 to the zero and right. But your efficiency of soil transport is relatively limited. You end up clustering right around the angle of repose, which is shown by this green dashed line. And in other circumstances, you can get a variety of different slope angles um, out of this model. Um, so it seems like we can reproduce variation in slope angles. Um, the model can also reproduce variations in the degree of alluvial cover. So here's a set of experiments, each dot one model experiment, weathering rate parameter on the x-axis, fractional soil cover or regolith cover here from rocky to soil mantled, and it's not very complicated. The result sort of makes sense. It's primarily about how weatherable the rocks are. Probably in the Apennines, it also has to do with dissolution, though we'll, we haven't dug too deeply into that. 
The question of fault dip uh, of, of slope break at the base is also something the model hints at. Um, this is an array of experiments in disturbance efficiency and weathering efficiency. Essentially, what we find is when the weathering efficiency is relatively low, you're prone to get a slope break at the fault base, at the fault trace. And when it's relatively high, you tend to get a smooth transition right across the fault trace. And remember that when I say weathering rate, I really mean weathering rate relative to fault slip rate. So there's a tectonic piece here. So the, the last, um, so, so it seems like we can, we can uh, we have a theory that can account for some of these observations. The last one I wanna say just a few words about is to return to this question of fault scarp. So I mentioned that in the Italian case, there's a lot of fault scarps that are latest Pleistocene to Holocene in age. And here's pictures of them again. And the question is why, what, what do these things represent? The hypothesis in the Italian geological community has long been that this has something to do with climate change and the efficiency of geomorphic processes. That under full glacial climate, although the Apennines weren't heavily glaciated, there were some alpine glaciers, um, that it might have been, there's something about the climate that would have uh, led to any earthquake that makes a little sort of proto-scarp to have that scarp being erased pretty quickly, whereas under the Holocene climate, that doesn't happen. When we got really curious about this, uh, about why that would be, what is it about the climate that might lead to such a strong contrast? It's kind of interesting, right? Um, the first thing you could do is think about the processes. And if you kind of do an, an inventory of the processes that might change as we go from glacial to interglacial, well, one is carbonate dissolution, but that doesn't seem to quite work in the right direction because if anything, you would expect more vigorous um, dissolution under the Holocene climate. Plus, um, there's a lot of clastic debris in these basins. So clearly, it's not just these things aren't just dissolving. There's a lot of mechanical weathering. Another possibility has to do with vegetation that, you know, maybe there was more vigorous root growth in the past that would shatter rock. We know roots can do that. Um, but that also works in the wrong direction. The, Paleo climate records indicate that there's more woody vegetation in the Holocene than in the last glacial. So that doesn't seem to work. One that potentially does work though has to do with a process called frost cracking. Um, and this is something that uh, is a process that we know can drive cracking of rocks. There's been really interesting experimental work that shows that when you have um, ice together with super cooled water in rocks um, that the growth of lenses of ice as the supercooled water migrates to the freezing centers can do a lot of damage to rock. Um, and that process seems on the basis of lab experiments to be most active when you're several degrees below the freezing point, not massively below it, but a little bit below it. For example, in this image from a, a beautiful study by Halle and colleagues in 1991 shows cracking in the laboratory in these black bars associated with temperatures sort of minus three to minus six, seven, eight, something like that. So the question is, is the region in Italy that we're interested in, where does it sit in relation to these, where does the climate sit in relation to this temperature range? And it turns out today's climate is a little bit warm for that. Certainly there are cold places, there's an altitude effect, there are places that are sub-freezing, they're ski resorts, I mean, this happens. But the regional climatology is one in which you don't, you, you don't sit for long periods of time in that temperature window. Here's a regional climatology um, in the Apennine city of L'Aquila. Here's a kind of an abstraction of that here. So we have Julian day of the year from January to December and temperature, the blue is the daily minimum. Here's our frost cracking window, which I put at minus three to minus eight. So, the climatology today doesn't really favor a lot of frost shattering of rock. But during the last glacial, this whole uh, climatology would have been depressed. And pollen records suggest it could have been depressed by a lot, like as much as 12 degrees C. If that were the case, this is what the climatology might have looked like 20,000 years ago. So that your, your winter temperatures, which would be here and here, and your autumn temperatures, 
might have sat well within that frost shattering window. So that's a potential mechanism for um, essentially destroying bedrock scarps as they start to grow under full glacial climate and not doing it under today's climate. So the last model experiment I'll show you is just kind of a feasibility test for that idea. We're gonna take one of our modeled hill slopes and change the weathering efficiency through time. We'll start off with very efficient weathering and then we'll crank it down as if we had just gone into a Holocene climate. Here's what the result looks like. We're growing our partly mantled facet and then we shift to a less weatherable climate and we grow a scarp. And here our cell size is half a meter. So that's about a 20 meter high scarp in this example. So at least we could say that the model is consistent with that explanation. So, okay, so I, I've shown you kind of a tour through um, us scratching our heads about facets and thinking about a model that might be able to account for some of their morphology. And I think here's a few of what I think are maybe the take home messages from this. We have a model that's, that's process based in a simple way with two parameters that seems to be able to account for some of the diversity among the facets that we see on some of these normal fault systems. We can explain them in terms of variations in the fault slip rate, the weathering intensity, and the soil disturbance efficiency. Another neat thing is that it does look as if, from the Wasatch at least, that there is a correlation between the facet slope angle and the fault slip rate, which maybe suggests that this could be a reconnaissance level paleoseismology tool. We haven't gotten to the point where we can quantitatively deduce slip rate from facet angle, but we can at least say that there is a relationship that's demonstrable. And finally, this, um, this idea of a change in climate changing the weathering efficiency does seem like a consistent explanation um, for these Mediterranean fault scars. So I'll stop there, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gregory. That was a fantastic talk. Um, questions? If, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and, uh, and talk. I know I have one. Okay, so maybe I'll start. Um, so so I, I'm interested in the, um, you know, you said you, you, you didn't look in, into details when, when you looked into the, you know, the, the carbonate landscapes and then carbonate dissolution effect. But I was wondering if you can, if you noticed in your mo when modeling and looking at the weathering uh, coefficients and uh, uh, did you did you notice any uh, systematic you know, uh, difference in this uh, uh, optimized uh, properties between carbonate and silicate uh, bedrock uh, or, or facets that evolved over carbonate or silicate bedrocks? Well, what I think what I could say is that the effectively what dissolution should do is to assist the soil transport process by basically removing some of the soil, right? So if you've got some of the fine sediment that you're creating from mechanical weathering, some of that is gonna lose mass by dissolution. So right. you have less to move off of the slope. And so in that sense, it, it reduces your D prime, or sorry, increases your D prime effectively. Mm -hmm. by how much, I don't know. I don't think we can quantify that yet, but that's definitely what the effect is. And I suspect that's why some of these Apennine slopes are so sediment poor um, because once you get to a fine grain size, they start to dissolve. Right. As I said, that's not the whole story because there's clearly a mechanical piece because you've got these basins that are full of this angular carbonate debris. So there's definitely a mechanical piece to it. And it's not like all the mass or even most of it is dissolving, but there may be enough to make a big difference in soil cover. Hmm. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a more general question about, you know, <laughs> carbonate hill slope in, you know, in general. Um, and uh, do you think that this model can be applied to kind of tease apart, you know, physical from uh, chemical or from the solution, um, you know, um, as, as two, two governing processes? For for uh, hill slope evolution, can you? Because I mean, we have right here in Jerusalem, we have this you know, beautiful concave uh, and, and 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 really planar uh, hill slopes, 
no, there is no, uh, um, um, you know, uh, fault at the, at the foot of this hill slope at all. But it's it's it, it's definitely it doesn't look like a purely diffusional uh, feature. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so yeah, potentially. I mean, I think what would be really interesting if you could find a natural experiment that juxtaposes a carbonate and let's say a silicic clastic rock under the same base level forcing conditions. Right. That'd be your comparative test. Yeah. Super, super interesting stuff. Uh, more questions? One from the audience, just speak up if you have any question. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, it's just a small question. Um, in the photo from the Apennines, I think, it was where you see the difference between the carbonate uh, heat slope and the soil mantle. Um, it looks like um, you have, uh, I think to me it was obvious uh, reels in the soil. And, but also between the reels, it's very uh, convex morphology. So it looks like you have uh, maybe two processes uh, going on in transporting the, the sediments. Um, so you think your model is, can, can, can work with both processes? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, this is one of the weaknesses of the model is we have not tried to account for water erosion or overland flow erosion or reeling. Um, and, and deliberately, because we wanted to tackle the the sort of granular side of things first. Um, so that's sort of on the horizon still to think about how to do that. It's a different kind of a problem because you have to think about the aggregation of flow, the generation of runoff. And in, in some cases for these steep canyons, you have to think about debris flows as possible formative agents. Um, and it's all potentially doable. It probably requires a, a uh, well, I was going to say a 2D approach. It requires a sort of a plan form approach because you need to think about the collection area of the water and how it mm -hmm. aggregates and then carries material downstream. And so we have, we've developed landscape evolution models that can begin to do that, but there's still a lot of open questions about, you know, what is the role of, uh, of grain size as it changes downstream? What about the uh, infiltration capacity of the soils? You know, how many, how many storms do you essentially drink up uh, by just allowing them to infiltrate. That's actually, I know, a question that um, that Yuval and Yehuda are both interested in, and along with Efrat on a on a project we have on um, desert escarpments. So the answer is this: this particular model is not up to that job. And this, you know, we always have. It's it's an interesting sort of philosophical challenge that you have to you have to make a decision when you're going to try and model these kinds of geomorphic system, whether you're going to try to include all the processes, which uh, gives you more realism potentially, but it also is much harder to understand as a human being. <laughs> so we took the approach of saying, well, look, we're going to restrict ourselves just to these steep uh, slopes between gullies and rills, where we think runoff is not a major contributor, though we could be wrong. We could be fooling ourselves on that. But at least we don't have any evidence that it's a big contributor. And to focus on the weathering and mechanical transport by gravity processes. And that allows us to get away with this model that just has two dimensionless parameters. So it's great. As a human being, I can understand two dimensionless parameters. But the weak point is that that leaves you open to leaving out potentially important processes altogether. So, you know, my, my sort of approach tends to be well, let's start with the simplest problem. Let's try to map that out. And then once we've understood that, then we'll add another piece and try to mirror that with a place, like I was mentioning, you know, a natural experiment in carbonates versus silicic clastics. If we wanna try and nail the dissolution piece, let's find an experiment where we think we can, we can have a, a ground truth to test this. Because I think for these kind of geological timescale problems, natural experiments are kind of one of the only ways we have to go, right? Because we're talking about processes that are happening too slowly to reproduce in the lab, except in a kind of an analogous way, right? I mean, there's good lab work that's been done. Don't get me wrong in hill slope geomorphology, but I think that um, as we go testing geomorphic models, it becomes really important to find case studies in nature where we have enough constraints 
we can measure what's what's happened over you know 10,000 years or a thousand years or whatever your time scale may be, and then use that as a basis for testing a model. So that's a long, long answer to a, a really simple question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, anyone else? If not, I, I have I have one more. I guess uh, I, I have one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, so it, if I understand correctly from your last example, um, you can get the same um, result if you change the sleep rate, not uh, not climate, right? Yes, that's true. So, yes. So, how can you know, or or uh, what's Okay. Did you consider that? Is that also people thought about it? What? Yeah. So we. So that's a possibility. It would require that all the faults in the region started slipping faster in the in the Holocene. And I showed you an example in the Wasatch where that does seem to have happened mm -hmm. because there's a big load in this Paleo Lake removed. So it's a possibility. But on the other hand, the Apennines doesn't have a giant Paleo Lake uh, to remove. Or, but maybe isostatic rebound if you, you know, if glaciers are, or you said it was. Yeah, glacier. potentially with the ice, potentially with the ice. Um, so we haven't looked deeply into this. I, my guess is that there wasn't enough mass in the Alpine glaciers to make that much of a difference. And also that you would expect some faults would have accelerated and others not. Well, maybe they did. So it's a possibility. We can't totally rule it out. Um, I think it needs somebody to do the, you know, to do the mechanical modeling of the fault mechanics to see whether if I take the little alpine glaciers that were present there and I remove them over you know, a couple thousand years, is that enough to, to unload the faults and let them dramatically accelerate their slip rates? Um, but I guess the other piece of evidence that we can invoke is that, so the, you know, the, the geometry of the problem is, well, let me put it this way. So it, it looks as if from a rough calculation we did on one of those fault scarps where you just measure the volume that's been removed in the time that scarp has existed as a feature. So over a few thousand years, mm -hmm. it leads to a pretty low rate of weathering and erosion, like, you know, tens, 10 or 20 microns per year. And that turns out to be similar to what other folks have identified in Slovenian, Italy, uh, Northeastern Italy on carbonates. So it's sort of what you might expect. I mean, it, it matches contemporary erosion rates, but it's a lot right. lower than what you need to, um, to explain the facet slopes, like by an order of magnitude. Right. So that's right. another piece of evidence. You know, I wouldn't lean too heavily on those measurements because it was just one site and we're, you know, we're just measuring these little pits and things in the false scarp, but it's, maybe a little hint that indeed we would expect the rates of weathering and erosion to be lower under the Holocene climate. Right. Um, all right. Uh, I think you're off the hook unless anyone has another question. All right. So uh, I'd like to, I'd like to th thank you again for a really uh, super interesting talk and for accepting the invitation. <laughs> thank you, it's great fun. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you, and uh, yeah, we'll see everybody uh, next uh, week uh, for a seminar. <laughs> thank right. you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to end this meeting. Bye now. All right. Nice to meet you, Ari. Likewise. Care.